almost completely with the body. All of our feelings of ego identity are bound up with the body. These feelings have a long historical tradition and have apparently always been problematic for man. As we shall see in the following comparative ethnological studies, drawn from many cultures, it has always been difficult for man to free himself of the idea that the dead person is identical with his body. Ethnology, therefore, speaks of the motif of the living corpse, for the dead body was at first still treated to a great extent as a living being. In many cultures, for instance, those of the Indo-Germanic peoples, the corpse was kept in the house for a month or longer after death. To make this possible, the body was treated with temporary embalming means. The survivors drank, ate, and played in its presence. In other cultures, the corpse was kept in the house or in a relatively shallow grave nearby until it began to decompose, or even until its complete skeletonization, and only afterwards were the remains more deeply buried. It was believed that the soul of the body continued to dwell in the surrounding environments. Some races believe that during this period the dead person, as an incubus or succubus, can even have sexual intercourse with a surviving partner. Even in those cultures where the idea that the dead pass over into a beyond clearly predominates, customs which look upon the corpse as a representative of the dead person have continued to exist. This is especially apparent in the custom of the so-called feeding of the dead, which has been widespread among almost all peoples and to some extent still is. In many places, a tube is put into the grave on a level with the corpse so that the dead body can receive liquid offerings, or for a period of time a hole is left open on a level with the head so that the corpse can breathe. The belief is that the dead eat the food offerings and it is claimed that the food presented at the grave or at the funeral meal actually decreases. A spiritualization of this view seems to have spread only gradually, as people began to believe that the dead man lived merely on the smell or the vapor of the food offerings rather than on the food itself. There is also a Chinese belief that things that the dead require in the beyond need only be drawn on a paper and then burned, so that their image may reach the beyond with the smoke. In many places, the corpse began to be represented during funeral ceremonies by a living person wearing the clothes of the dead. Thus, the corpse itself was therefore no longer regarded unconditionally as the person of the dead man. Many peoples make a kind of doll, an image or symbolic construction, to serve as a substitute for the corpse. The Siberian Goldie, for instance, place a white cloth on the bed of the dead person, a cushion with mandala drawings on the cloth, and in front of it a wooden picture of Ayami Fanyalko, the tutelary spirit of the dead, with a burning tobacco pipe stuck in its mouth. All offerings for the dead are then presented to this figure. At one time, the Chinese used such a doll for the same purpose, a doll made from a loincloth and called Mungo. The Chinese believed that the spirit of the dead person was present in the figure and no longer in the corpse. Koreans, even today, sometimes construct such an image of the dead, just as do the Tibetans. The Japanese also make a tamashiro, a receptacle in which the soul of the deceased is carried in the funeral ritual. In China, the ancestors' tablets actually served the same purpose, as did the statue of the dead with the ancient Egyptians erected in the sardab, or the tomb. It becomes more or less apparent in observing such customs that the primitive identification of a dead person with the corpse only gradually dissolved as the latter began to be distinguished from some symbol of concrete identity. But the dead man obviously had to possess a body in order not to lose himself in space or to retain a pediatere in case he wanted to visit his family. Not only were the dead regarded for a long time after death and over and over again as identical with the corpse, but often the sense of the whereabouts of the dead man could not be distinguished at first from that of the corpse in the grave. The widespread notion that the land of the dead is full of dust and worms and is clammy and dark indicates an inability to separate the idea of the dead person from the idea of the actual situation of the corpse. Sheol, the Old Testament abode of the dead is identical in part with the grave in which the dead man lay. Hell in the Teutonic world of the dead, Mechlin of the old Mexicans, and the dismal Hades of the Greeks, to mention just a few, are also characterized by such dark traits. Later there appeared in many advanced cultures a tendency toward bipartite or multisectional partitioning of man's idea of the beyond. Common people, evil individuals, and those killed in a specific manner go to such a dark place. Whereas certain carefully chosen individuals arrive after death at an extremely pleasant beyond, which is situated above the ground. In the dark haze of modern Greeks, for instance, there are no doctors, priests, or saints, 
and the ancient Greeks believed that those who had been initiated into the Orphic or Eleusian mysteries went not to Hades, but to a glorious Eleusium or to the islands of the blessed. Nor did the fallen warriors of the Germanic peoples travel to hell, 